Hello aspirants, welcome to the Hindi News Analysis brought to you by Shankar Ice Academy. Today, in this video, we are going to cover some of the important articles taken from the Hindi News edition dated 8th of September 2022. These are the articles I have taken for discussion. Pay attention to these discussions because a quiz question will be posted along with this video. It will be posted as a poll. Don't forget to attend it. Now let me take this first article for discussion. This one appeared in Thiruvananthapuram edition. The news article proudly announces that three Indian towns have got the status of UNESCO learning city. So before seeing the news, let us know about this status and its significance first. First of all, know that this status is given under a UNESCO program called as the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. Basically, it is an international policy oriented network. It provides inspiration, the know-hows and also the best practices. But for what it gives inspiration and best practices? Yes, you are right, to become a learning city. So this brings us to the question of what is a learning city? See, a learning city promotes lifelong learning for all. According to UNESCO's definition, a learning city is a city that has these key features. These are the building blocks of learning city. First, it effectively mobilizes its resources in every sector and such resources help in promoting inclusive learning from basic education to higher education. Then it also revitalizes learning in families and communities. It facilitates learning for workplace and also learning in the workplace. Then it extends the use of modern learning technologies. Then there is enhanced quality and excellence in learning in these cities. And more importantly, it fosters a culture of learning throughout life. So through this, the city enhances individual empowerment and social inclusion, along with economic development, cultural prosperity, and also attaining sustainable development. So these are the objectives behind having a learning city. Now, to achieve these objectives, the network was initiated in 2012 by the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, UIL. You should also note that the whole framework of this network is guided by a declaration called Beijing Declaration on Building Learning Cities of 2013. But we know that different cities may have different practices to learn. Now, to share such ideas with other cities only, this network is used. So it promotes policy dialogue along with peer learning among member cities. It also forges links and partnerships. It provides capacity development, etc. So whatever is needed to learn from other city is provided through this network. And by doing this, the network supports the achievement of all the 17 sustainable development goals. But you should remember there are two main goals that are directly linked to this network. One is sustainable development goal 4. It is about ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. And then we have goal number 11. It aims to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. So these two SDGs are directly linked to this network. So how many members are there in this network? Currently, it comprises of 294 member cities from 76 countries. So from this, you can understand that the member is the city itself. But that city is represented by the mayor of that city or by the person who has been formally endorsed as a representative of that city by the government. Now to become a member, membership applications have to be submitted to National Commission for UNESCO. Now what about India? Do we have any member cities in this network? So far, there were no member cities, but now three Indian cities have become part of this network. These are the cities of Warangal from Telangana, Nilambur and Trishur from Kerala. So these are the nation's first entrants in UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. Now, due to certain specialties only, these cities have been chosen. Let us see in brief what are these specialties. First, if you take Warangal, it has a rich cultural heritage. The city is a major tourism venue. It welcomes 3.2 million tourists every year and it also provides free training to the transgender communities that directly helps them to have employment opportunities. 
Additionally, over 125,000 citizens belonging to various self-help groups have found to be addressing various issues concerning women, marginalized communities, etc. So due to these specialties only, Warangal has been chosen. Now come to Nilambur. So it is called as the land of teak. Nilambur is also an ecotourism destination in Kerala. Mainly the city offers free healthcare facilities to all citizens. Then it also utilizes health volunteers to provide door-to-door treatment for bedded patients. Nilambur also aspires to become a woman-friendly city by ensuring equal opportunities in all sectors and by reducing harassment. So along with this, these are the other good practices in the city. You can just go through it. Now next is Trishur. We know that it is the cultural capital of Kerala. Trishur is home to academic and research institutions also. It is also known for its jewelry industry, especially gold industry. Now one of the good practices that is highlighted by the network is the presence of MSME Development Institute of India Regional Center in Trishur. Now this institute offers institutional support in promoting decent work and entrepreneurship through upskilling. Other than this, Trishur Puram festival is also highlighted Why? Because we know it is an annual event which celebrates artistic traditions, cultural, musical and folk art traditions. And it also attracts large number of people from other regions and countries also. So due to these specialties, Trishur has also been selected. So I hope you got an idea about what is a UNESCO learning city and what are the specialties of the three Indian cities that has been chosen in the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. Which are these cities? Varangal in Telangana, Nilambur in Kerala and Trishur in Kerala. So that's all about this discussion. Let us move on to the next one. So our next article discussion is going to be based on this front page article and this editorial article that appeared in yesterday's newspaper. See, day before yesterday only, we covered about various aspects of India-Bangladesh relations. We also discussed some of the issues in these relations. But in this discussion, we are not going to see that. Rather, we are going to see about the outcomes of Bangladesh Prime Minister's visit to India. As you know, the Bangladesh Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, met our Indian Prime Minister. And this has resulted in two positive outcomes and we have signed seven agreements as a result of this. So, we'll see two of the main agreements in today's discussion. And before that, this is the syllabus that you can link to this discussion. See, basically, the overall outcomes of the meeting seem to have further strengthened the ties between the two nations because both the countries have signed seven memorandum of understandings. And these MOUs or agreements include the conclusion of the first water sharing agreement in 26 years and it also includes infrastructure projects, particularly in the railway sector, etc. I have given the seven MOUs here for your reference. You can just go through it. Now, among these seven, the most important one is the water sharing agreement, which has been signed with respect to Kushiara River. See, Kushiara River is one of the transboundary rivers of Bangladesh. It is actually a tributary of River Barak that flows in India. You can see River Barak in this map. This River Barak originates from the northern hills of Assam and India, and then it flows further, creating an approximate border between Nagaland and Manipur. The river flows westward from the Kachar district in India. And then it enters Bangladesh. Actually, at Amal Sheet, this Barak River separates into two branches. The northwest arm of this river is called as the Surma River and the southwest arm is what is called as the Kushiara River. Okay, so this is what the geography of Kushiara River. It is a tributary of River Barak. But as you know, the common transboundary rivers have an issue with regards to how the water availability is distributed across time and space. That is, sometimes the water will be more, so this might cause floods in the lower riparian regions. See, whenever we talk about rivers, we talk about the riparian regions, especially the upper and lower riparian regions. See, the starting point of the river will be called as the upper riparian region and the river where it flows to will be the place of lower riparian region. For example, in case of Kushiara, India is the upper riparian state, whereas Bangladesh is the lower riparian state. Okay, so when the water is more across the river, it will definitely cause floods in the lower riparian regions. But on the other hand, during any dry season, the availability of water will be very low. So during that time, the available water might be utilized by the upper riparian states. And when this happens, the lower riparian states will receive only minimal amount of water. 
So that means here both the situations that is when there is more water and when there is less water who is affected here the lower riparian state gets affected the same happens with the kushiara river also and to address this issue only now this treaty of kushiara water sharing has been signed between india and bangladesh and this has happened for the first time in 26 years that both the countries have signed a treaty to share the water and this treaty will benefit both southern assam and india and also the sylhet region in bangladesh but you should note that this plan did not appear out of nowhere actually it was finalized last month itself when the india bangladesh joint river commission was held in new delhi after 12 years at that time itself it was agreed by both sides to expand cooperation to areas like addressing pollution in rivers also but i said that for the first time in 26 years both the countries have signed a treaty to share water why because as you know india and bangladesh have a ganga water treaty that was signed in 1996 so after that treaty now only we are signing a treaty to share the water and this treaty of kushiara is quite important for bangladesh also especially for the bilateral relation of india bangladesh because this is seen as a first step in terms of settling the highly controversial subject of water management for 54 transboundary rivers between both the countries but if you ask me whether bangladesh got what it asked for actually no because bangladesh has been waiting for the tista water agreement for a long time rather now the kushiara agreement has been finalized and signed so this is regarding the water sharing agreement between india and bangladesh Now the second important MOU we are going to discuss is the bilateral connectivity initiatives involving uh, railway tracks and rolling stock between both the countries. So here when we say rolling stock it refers to all the engines and carriages that are used on the railways. Or in other words rolling stock uh, comprises all the vehicles that move along a railway. like including the powered vehicles and unpowered vehicles such as locomotives, passenger carriages etc. so both the countries have mentioned about the provisions of rolling stock in their mous along with that upgrading of the track between hilly and birampur was also discussed see hilly is a region present in west bengal along the international border between india and bangladesh and birampur is an important city in bangladesh that borders india and this city is 250 kilometers away from capital city of bangladesh which is dhaka but despite being far from the capital birampur is still flourishing economically and culturally in bangladesh and that is why connectivity to this region is important for india and on these lines there is also another connectivity project but this is regarding the sub regional rail project in bangladesh and this aims to convert the tongi akhaura line into dual gauge so this conversion of the railway line would create direct rail links inside bangladesh especially between chatogram and rajshahi and chatogram and khulna here chatogram is nothing but the official name of chittagong why this is important because currently railway lines in the eastern region of bangladesh are in meter gauge so now the upgradation to dual gauge will allow applying of high speed broad gauge trains on this route and this will reduce the travel time significantly It is also said that this will enable the trains to transport 30 percentage more passengers and goods once this conversion takes place. Now, on the similar lines, upgradation of track and signalling systems and railway stations along Benapol Jashore line of Bangladesh is also agreed. And most importantly, the restoration link between India and Bangladesh has also been discussed. This is between Burimari in Bangladesh and Changrabanda in India. so just go through these names once again just to have an idea about where these places are so what these rail links aim to achieve these multiple rail track projects will create a smooth flow of goods and people within bangladesh and also from india to bangladesh so from these two mous we can say that both the countries are going to benefit a lot but along with that the editorial also cites about few of the concerns of dhaka that india must address so we know that in the recent times the ruling party leaders have made several comments on bangladesh which is not welcome by all for example they have made comments on deporting rohingya refugees they have commented on the citizenship amendment act and also they have made references to annexing bangladesh for akhand bharat so this has also created some cross border tensions but beyond these issues now new delhi and dhaka 
have remained focused on their future cooperation and through these MOUs they want to build on their past partnership as it existed immediately after the independence of Bangladesh in December 1971. So what kind of cooperation existed in 1971 will be revitalized through these MOUs. And that is why the author of the editorial has given the title to the editorial as Spirit of 1971. Okay. So beyond all the issues, in the spirit of uh, partnership, both the countries have signed these MOUs. I hope you got overall idea about what are the important agreements between India and Bangladesh as a result of the recent meetings. Now let us move on to the next discussion. So now this discussion is going to be based on this news article. As you can see here, it says the union cabinet has approved a new scheme called PM Shri. So in this discussion, we'll see what this scheme is about and also its major objectives. See, first of all, know that here PM Shri stands for Pradhan Mantri School for Rising India Scheme. So you can say that this scheme revolves around developing the schools. Mainly, it aims to turn the existing government schools into model schools. And these model schools will be used for the implementation of National Educational Policy 2022. Okay. And here when I say the existing schools, it means the ones which are being managed by the central government, state government or the union territory government or even by local bodies. Now, under this scheme, it has been envisaged to develop more than 14,500 schools across the country by strengthening the selected schools. So, what are the key objectives of this scheme? First of all, it will provide high quality education in an equitable, inclusive and joyful school environment. So, that means for this, it will take care of many factors like the diverse background of the children, their multilingual needs. It will take care of the different academic abilities of children. And by knowing all these factors about the students, it will make them active participants in their own learning process. So, this is the first objective. And second, the schools under the scheme will provide leadership to other schools in their respective region. And this will be done by providing mentorship. Other than that, the schools will be developed as green schools. This means it will incorporate the green technologies. Or we can say it will be incorporating environment friendly aspects. For example, like it will be having solar panels and LED lights. It will include nutrition gardens with uh, natural farming. There will be waste management and the environment will be plastic free. There will be water conservation and harvesting also. So by incorporating all these measures, the schools will be developed as green schools. Other than that, the focus will be on learning outcomes of every child in every grade. So to know the learning outcomes, assessment will be done at all levels. And this assessment will include the students' conceptual understanding and their application of knowledge to real life situations. Another objective of this scheme is to provide linkage with sector skill councils and local industry so that there will be better employment opportunities. See here, these sector skill councils are set up as autonomous industry-led bodies. It is set up by the National Skill Development Corporation. Actually, these skill councils are the major pillars of NSDC. Because they create occupational standards and qualification bodies and they also develop competency framework. It conducts training programs, conducts skill gap studies and it also assesses and certifies trainees on the curriculum which is aligned with national occupational standards developed by them. So overall, these sector skill councils, they play vital role in bridging the gap between what the industry demands and what these skill requirements ought to be. So by providing linkage with these councils, the schools will know what is the current demand of the industry and based on that, the required skill will be developed. Apart from all these, the scheme also develops a school quality assessment framework. This framework includes key performance indicators to measure the outcomes. So if you want to measure the outcomes, quality evaluation of these schools has to be done. This will be done at regular intervals. Such evaluation will ensure that the desired standards are existing at all levels. So in short, once these schools are developed, they will showcase all the components of national educational policy and it will also offer mentorship to other schools in their surrounding areas. And these schools will deliver quality teaching for development of students, which is their overall objective. And also note that the scheme is a centrally sponsored scheme. And when we say a scheme is a centrally sponsored scheme, it means that the scheme is implemented by the state governments, but it is largely funded by the central government. For example, 
for the normal category states the share will be 60 to 40 ratios but with respect to the northeastern states and union territories the center's contribution can go up to 90 percentage also so these are the few points that you have to know about pm shri scheme pradhan mantri schools for rising india scheme okay with these points in mind now let us move to the next discussion so the last discussion is going to be based on this snippet article as you can see it mentions that the chief minister of delhi has asked the prime minister to find a solution to satlej jamuna link canal dispute so you can see that this canal dispute is gaining grounds so soon it will be making headlines and that is why today we are going to see about satlej jamuna link canal we'll start with the background that is why such canal is proposed See, in 1960, Indus Water Treaty was signed between India and Pakistan. Now, this treaty fixed and delimited the rights and obligations of both the countries, which was regarding the use of waters of this river system. And this treaty covered uh, some of the major tributaries of Indus River, such as Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Bias, and Satluj rivers. Now, this treaty gave the rights to use the water of the river Indus, Jhelum, and Chenab to the Pakistan, and the rivers Ravi, Bias, and Satluj to India. Okay, but in 1966, the separation of Haryana from Punjab happened, so this raised the issue of allocating river water to Haryana. So, in order to allocate the right share of waters to Haryana and Punjab from the Satluj and its tributary Bias, a canal connecting the Satluj River and the Yamuna River was planned by the central government. And this canal is what is called as the Satluj Yamuna Link Canal. But note that Punjab consistently refused to share water with Haryana. But finally, in 1981, both the states reached an agreement to reallocate water. So this is the background of how that canal was proposed. Now let us see what is the associated issues with this canal. So as I said, in 1981 there was an agreement between Punjab and Haryana to share the waters. And as a part of implementing this agreement in 1982, the then Prime Minister of India launched the construction of this canal in Patiala district of Punjab. Now try to recall who was the Prime Minister at that time. It was Indira Gandhi. So what was planned was the canal was going to run for a stretch of 214 kilometers, and in this 122 kilometers will be in Punjab, and the remaining will be in Haryana, which is about 92 kilometers. So this was what planned in 1982. But following the launch of this construction plan, agitations, protests, and assassinations were carried out in Punjab. So it halted the construction process. But then central government did not keep quiet. it started negotiating with the political party of punjab which was akali dal and then as a result of this negotiation in 1985 an accord was signed between the central government and this party note that this accord established a new tribunal to assess the water sharing between these states and uh, this tribunal was uh, presided over by the then supreme court judge v balakrishna eredi So after uh, this tribunal was constituted, it recommended that the shares of both uh, Punjab and Haryana should be increased. That is, their water shares should be increased. For Punjab, it should be increased to five million acre feet per year, and for Haryana, it should be increased to three point eight three million acre feet per year. And this recommendation was accepted by the government. So the construction started again. But then again, in nineteen ninety, the assassinations continued. so the construction was stopped again so you can see that in 1982 the construction started then it was stopped uh, later and then in 1985 an accord was signed as a result of this again the construction was started but then in 1990 it was stopped again so as a result of waiting for this canal construction finally haryana government appealed to the supreme court and this happened in 1996 it asked for the supreme court to order the punjab government to complete the work on this canal in their part but this issue was not immediately resolved by supreme court rather in 2002 and 2004 supreme court directed punjab government to complete the work on its territory but what happened in 2004 was the punjab assembly approved an act called punjab termination of agreements act and this agreement cancelled the water sharing agreements with haryana whatever they signed you know before it was cancelled by this act so the construction of this canal came to a halt and there was no return from this situation 
And after many years, finally in 2016, the Supreme Court again intervened and it said that the act was constitutionally invalid. That is the act which cancelled the agreement, right? That act of Punjab was constitutionally invalid. This was what held by the Supreme Court. Then after that in 2020, Supreme Court again directed the chief ministers of both the states to negotiate and to address the canal issue at highest political level. And this negotiation was to be mediated by the centre and we know that in 2020 we had the pandemic. So the issue still continues. And that is why now the chief minister of Delhi has asked the prime minister to look into this issue. So I have given an overview of why this canal was proposed and then what are the issues with this canal. Like any other uh, water sharing agreement, this canal was also opposed by one of the parties. Okay. Now before concluding, let me give you some facts about River Yamuna and River Sartlej also. As you know, River Yamuna is the second largest tributary of Ganges by discharge and it is the longest tributary of Ganga in India. It originates from the Yamuna 3 glacier. This glacier is in the southwestern slopes of Bandher Poonch peaks in Uttarakhand. This river has a total length of about 1300 kilometers and it merges with Ganges also. This happens in Allahabad, which is now called as Prayagraj. And if you know the uh, major tributaries of Yamuna, they are the rivers Tones, Giri, Hindon, Chambal, Banas, Sindh, Betwa and Kane. Now let me tell you about Sutledge. This is the longest tributary of Indus River. Okay. Now this river rises in the China's western Tibet in the Kailash mountain range. And this river has a length of about 1500 kilometers. And Sutledge meets the Bias River at Harike in Punjab. Okay. So in this discussion, we saw about the Satellite Yamuna Link Canal issue, what happened there and why the issue still continues. And finally, we also saw a few facts about Yamuna and Satellite. With these informations in mind, we are moving on to the last session of the day, which is the practice questions discussion session. So this is the first question. It is a pair-based question. On one side, Indian cities are given. And on the other side, the UNESCO world status is given. Let me read out the pairs. Hyderabad and Srinagar. Cultural World Heritage Sites, Jaipur and Ahmedabad, UNESCO Creative Sites, Warangal and Nilambur, UNESCO Learning Sites. Now, if you take the first pair, Hyderabad and Srinagar, it has been paired with Cultural World Heritage Sites. See, in India, we have about uh, 40 World Heritage Sites, including the cultural ones, natural ones and the mixed ones. And among these, three cities have been given Cultural World Heritage status, one is the historic city of Ahmedabad and the other one is Jaipur city in Rajasthan. Ahmedabad got the status in 2017 and Jaipur got its status in 2019. And also remember in 2021, Dholavira, which is a Harappan city in Gujarat, it got the World Heritage status in 2021. So you can see that only there are three cities that have got the World Heritage status as a whole. Other than this, we can find monuments in the cities that have got the recognition. But here, the whole city has got the recognition. So this pair is incorrect because Hyderabad and Srinagar did not get this status. Now come to second pair, Jaipur and Ahmedabad. Now you have to be careful here because just now we saw Jaipur and Ahmedabad, they have the cultural world heritage sites status. But on the other hand, Jaipur also has got the creative cities status. Okay, so don't get confused here. Whereas Ahmedabad is only a world heritage site and not a creative city under UNESCO. Here I have given other creative cities of India. You can just go through it. And from this you can find that the Hyderabad and Srinagar, which we saw in the first pair, they are creative cities of UNESCO, not world heritage sites. Now come to the third pair, Warangal and Nilambur. UNESCO learning sites. In this video, we have discussed about these two and they are UNESCO learning sites. Along with this, Trishur is also a learning city of UNESCO. So third pair is correct. First pair is incorrect. Second pair is incorrect. Third pair is correct. So the correct answer is option C3 only because the question asks us to choose the correct pairs. Now take up this uh, next question. Today we discussed about two important rivers in two discussions. Uh, in one discussion, we saw about uh, Satellite Jamuna and in the other discussion, we saw about Kushiara River. Now, this question is about the tributaries of River Yamuna. Let me read out the rivers given. Chambal, Sindh, Gomti, Betwa, Ghagra, Kane. 
So look at this representation. In this map, you can find both Yamuna and Ganga. We know that Yamuna is a tributary of Ganga. Okay. And here Yamuna flows parallelly to Ganga and then it meets Ganga in Allahabad or Prayagraj. And after that, it flows as Ganga only. And you can easily find that Chambal, Sindh, Betwa and Kena are tributaries of Yamuna, whereas Gomti and Ghagra are tributaries of Ganga River. So the correct answer to this question is option C, 1, 2, 4 and 6 only. Okay. So regarding rivers, it is better to, you know, just by heart all these uh, tributaries because these kinds of questions in prelims fetches you marks easily. Now with this, I also have this mains question for you. Interested aspirants can write answer to this question and post it in the comment section. Now before concluding, don't forget to attend the poll question that will be posted along with this video. Now I would also like to remind you about the pre-storming test series batch 1. Enroll to this batch because it starts on 12th of September this month from Monday onwards. And the first test in the pre-storming batch 1 starts on 19th September. This batch 1 includes 66 tests which involves GS tests, CSAT and also mock tests. All the tests will be conducted in offline mode which will be followed by a live discussion session. Along with this, for the students who have missed the offline test, there is also the option of taking the online test after two days. Okay, so don't miss this opportunity. This will be of great help to you in clearing the prelims 2023. So with this information, we have come to the end of this Hindi news analysis. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment and share. And also subscribe to Shankar IS Academy's YouTube channel for receiving regular updates regarding current affairs. Thank you.